Listen, it does not need to be a new year, a new you. It just needs to be a new year, a healthier you. Because sure, okay, they trying to take us down at every front. So get some TLC products and up that metabolism and up that energy and up that immune system, okay? That digestive system. Get that all together with these TLC products right here. And don't forget, okay, sign up for ifyoucanmove.com and become a part of the online gym and share the pounds, honey. We're starting a new challenge on January 3rd and I would love to see y'all there. Get the links down below. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl Bondi Blue and I am back for another Lovecraft Country review, you guys. All right, so I'm staying off camera um, just because it's just way easier for me to do it this way right now. Um, but y'all know I'll be back on camera soon enough, just not for uh, these reviews, but I will include some screenshots. So hopefully you guys will be able to follow along well enough and y'all will enjoy this review. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So this is Lovecraft Country episodes five and six. Y'all, Ruby then woke up as a white woman. Mm-hmm. Woke up as a mediocre looking, no disrespect, white lady. Okay, and I'm just saying that we have to point that out because I feel like Ruby is an exceptionally beautiful black woman. Like she is captivatingly beautiful from her skin tone to her body type to her facial features. She's giving you the Tweety Bird effect like she's beautiful. And the fact that her life is easier as a mediocre white woman versus being the statuesque goddess that she is, you know, actually like that's crazy to me. But I had to mention it because I think it says a lot about, you know, our experiences here in this country that you can be a goddess of a black woman and get treated like an animal, but be a mediocre white lady and get everything handed to you for free. Crazy. She runs out into the street. OK, now, mind you, she's on the south side. So she is a white lady looking disheveled, running out into the streets amongst a whole bunch of black people. All right. They're trying to help her. And she ends up bumping into a teenage boy who looked like he just got him some popcorn. And he was like, ma'am, are you OK? And then the police roll up out of nowhere as if they had been like watching from down the street or something, just waiting for a black person to bump into somebody white. And then here they come ready to beat the hell out of the teenage boy talking about oh did this animal do something to you ma'am and it was just kind of like so extra and even though ruby is kind of lost right now she's like officer it's okay he was just trying to help me you sure like the little boy you know he was tall but he was still a little boy you could see the fear in his face and it just really pissed me off this scene right here i swear i can't stand you mama. Mm. All right, let, let, let's go ahead and press on, okay? So the cops had received a call already, and that's why I think they were close by, because they had received a call from William saying that his wife was going through some type of episode. So the cops put her in a car, and they're bringing her back to William's place, and just as she's turning back into her black self, okay, stuff is starting to crack and, you know, and pop and all of that, they pull up, William takes her out of the car, you know, picks her up and takes her back into the house and lies her on plastic that he has put on the floor. And then he stabs her and cuts her out of the white lady skin. And she becomes, you know, black lady Ruby again. And you guys, a whole bunch of things here. First of all, the idea that a man can just call the police and say, hey, this woman is my wife. So if you see her somewhere, she's having like a crazy fit and y'all need to just bring her back home to me. No questions asked. No need to provide any proof or anything. They just pick her up and bring her back to his house. He could have been some type of like rapist or some type of man keeping her in a basement and it would have been fine because he was a man. So it not only showcases the racism, but it also showcases the sexism that a man can say anything and it will be believed and a woman just has to be dragged you know um any old place because a man said so when ruby finally awakens from her metamorphosis william explains to her how hiram epstein created a magical doorway when he couldn't do something that he wanted to do or get somewhere he wanted to get he would create a doorway and Ruby realizes that when she was running down the streets all disheveled, that she was treated like a human being. People weren't scared of her. People weren't trying to harm her. They were in fear for her, black and white. 
it was a new feeling for her to be treated so well. William leaves her with the potion and a wad of cash and tells her to do as she pleases. So she takes the potion and goes out on the town as a white woman. She enjoys her day being handled warmly in the world, given free ice cream, uh, allowed to sit on a park bench and read newspaper without anybody bothering her, which is something I'm sure she would not have been able to do as a black woman. Child, and people probably wouldn't even have served her ice cream, let alone gave it to her for free. She goes back to William's place and he asks why she didn't use the wad of cash. And, you know, she's turned back into herself and she's getting out of the tub. And she tells him it's because she used the only currency that she needed, whiteness. I said, mm, 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 you better speak on it, okay? She also says that she is tired of her womanness and her blackness and just her existence being interrupted by other people. Specifically white people, but, you know, more so than not, people in general always want to come and interrupt your life or interrupt your experience because you're black or because you're a woman. William tells her, then do whatever you want to do, uninterrupted. Go on ahead, girl, fly free. So she goes to Marshall Fields to get a job as Hillary Davenport, a white woman who is obviously overqualified for the job that she's trying to get. Now, we all know if Ruby had come in there with those same qualifications as a black woman, they either would not have hired her or they would have hired her and put her at the lowest rank possible. The man interviewing her at Marshall Fields asked how she feels about working with coloreds. And she says, well, if they work hard, she doesn't mind it. Everybody's just trying to get, you know, they, they money like everybody else. But for some reason, whenever black people showed up somewhere, it was this fear that they were going to be race warriors because white people are always in such fear that black people um, getting equality is somehow going to encroach on their freedoms in some way. It's really an unnatural response to all of the oppressing they've done over the past 400 years. He also says that a number of people who were working at Marshall Fields quit when they ended their whites only policy. He offers her an assistant management position just as she starts to go through metamorphosis and turn back into Black Ruby. Y'all, watching her change looks like some of the most painful shit you have ever seen. It's literally somebody busting out of their skin. I mean, it's disgusting to watch, but the graphics, you guys, the graphic capability on Lovecraft Country is a one as far as I'm concerned every time she went through metamorphosis I was like oh my god <laughs> oh my god I also noticed that her boss at Marshall Fields had to hug her before she left his office mm -hmm. here here's more on that sexism situation where y'all get to encroach on people's personal space getting fresh when she returns to work she talks to the black lady working at the counter, Tamara, who is doing all of the white girl's jobs, okay? She's mad at Tamara, going off on Tamara, telling her that she needs to be on her job so that she can be a credit to her people and all of this. When the truth of the matter is, Tamara is doing everybody's job because the white girls want to stay um, um, in the back trying on all of the merchandise and listening to music and shit. So they got Tamara running back and forth all over the damn place. That pissed me off. And even though Ruby is mad that this girl who tried to get this job on a whim got a job that she had been thinking about and working hard for most of her life, I still feel like... I was so upset at Ruby for the way she treated Tamara. I was so upset because inside you're still a black lady. Okay, you're still a black lady. And the way these white batches was treating Tamara, she did not need you to come up behind them and make the situation worse and tell her that she wasn't working hard enough when she was doing everybody else's damn job because they didn't want to do theirs. She should have been giving all of that same energy to them white girls who was in the back trying on stilettos and shit. So Hillary, okay, that's Ruby as a white woman, asked the white ladies who work in the bank about their boss and how, you know, he got fresh with her and she wonders if he had gotten fresh with any of them. And they kind of just laugh it off and say, you know, the price you pay for being a working woman is having men sexually assault you. 
Can you believe that we're just now getting to a point in the past couple of years where the Me Too movement is something that is to be feared? Like all of the years of women being expected to take this type of treatment and just lay down, like it, it, it's insane to me. It's insane that more of you men have not ended up dead from being poisoned, just saying. And so after they laugh off what she said about their boss, they talk about not wanting more Tamaras walking through the door, but they do want her to take them to the South side so that they can go and, you know, see the black folks like a safari and they need a tour guide. When I tell y'all, I wanted to kick that lady's ass. Like that shit had me so hot, so mad <laughs> when she said that shit. After work, William, is sitting outside waiting for Hillary to uh, pick her up from work, right? And all of the other girls are jealous when they see how fine he is sitting outside on his nice car waiting on her. He actually gifts her with a maid's uniform and tells her not to take the potion because he has a request to make. He wants her to plant something in a, a Lancaster's office at the lodge. There seems to be another lodge for the Sons of Adam here in Chicago. So she does it. She dresses up like a maid and she goes to the lodge and dies on the inside as she pretends to be a maid to these evil white people. And she waits on Christina to show up because she was supposed to get her orders from Christina. So just as she's like, where is this bitch at? Christina shows up and gives her what she's supposed to leave in Lancaster's office. When she goes in there to, you know, leave whatever she was supposed to leave because I missed it. When she sneaks inside his office, she ends up getting stuck in a closet with a man who had his throat slit but somehow was still alive to make noise. And then she had to put her hand over his mouth and her mouth to keep the other cops from hearing them in the closet. I mean, they knew a man was hanging in there moaning and shit, but it was still like, oh my God. And then Lancaster has all these different colors of skin all over his body he obviously has been some type of science uh project for Hiram Epstein Hiram Epstein whatever so this was a tad bit traumatic for Ruby so she gets back to work as Hillary and flips out on Tamara because she's not making all of the black people look good okay you have to work twice as hard okay because white folks are fucked up and they're even more fucked up than you think they are, okay? She's going off and all of the, you know, white people down to Marshall Fields are looking at her like, what the hell is going on with Hillary? What is she talking about? Why is she getting loud? <laughs> and so she plays it off and says, oh, nothing's going on. Tamara was just saying that she was going to take us all to the South Side to party tonight. And of course, that's what they want. So they are excited to go to the South Side so that they can gawk at black people like animals. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the white girls are fetishizing the black men down to the club. And Tamara has to show them how to dance, okay? Tamara is stressed out. She just wanted to get her shots and go home. And here she is having to show all of these rhythmless, annoying-ass white people how to dance. Ruby goes out back and turns back into a black woman <laughs> in the alley. And this is when she overhears her boss sexually assaulting Tamara. Tamara scratches him and then runs off and he calls her a n-word bitch. Ruby gets back to William's place and Christina shows up and tries to use their womanhood once again to appeal to Ruby and Ruby says the only thing white women are disillusioned by is themselves so please don't use your womanhood and try to act like you understand how I feel when I just walked around as a white woman and totally understood the difference between our existences so don't try to act like you get it because you don't. Christina tells Ruby that that William's invitation, meaning her using the potion and the invitation to have the sexual relationship and everything they got going on right now, was for Ruby to do whatever the fuck she wanted to do. And if she has yet to do that, she needs to go on ahead and stretch her legs out. See, she thought she was doing what she wanted to do when she went and got the job at Marshall Fields. But now she realizes that there's something even more that she wants to do. So Ruby takes the potion and goes back to Marshall Fields to quit her job. She tells her boss that she has to quit because she's attracted to him. And you know, that's the only way to handle things is to quit her job so that they can have a sexual relationship. She says she's quitting so that she can fuck his brains out. 
she ties him up and he likes it. Then she puts her panties in his mouth and he really likes it. But then she takes off her stiletto heel and stabs him in the buttocks several times in a very painful way as she metamorphoses back into Black Ruby. I mean, it was quite the picture to see her beating him in the ass to Cardi B while this white lady skin is ripping off her body with all of the blood everywhere. And after she finished, you know, beating him in the ass with the stiletto, she says, I just wanted you to know a N-word bitch did this to you. Okay, I was like, yes to the Cardi B. These blood issues, okay? <laughs> so then she goes back to Williams and she asks him what's in the basement because every time she sees William or Christina, they're coming out of the basement and it's the only room in the house that's locked. So she wants to know what the hell is going on in the basement. And then William starts to go through metamorphosis and turns into Christina. And this is when we realize that William and Christina are the same damn person and that Ruby and Christina have been fucking. Tick and Letty go to Montrose's room the morning or the day after they had come back with Yahima, okay? And they're looking for Yahima, like, where's Yahima? And we all know that Montrose killed Yahima to protect Tick. Letty doesn't realize that Yahima is dead, but Tick does. Tick asks Montrose what happened to the pages, and he doesn't say anything. So Tick loses his shit and starts to beat Montrose into a bloody pulp until some of the other men who live in the house come to separate them. Tick runs down to the basement to look at some of the pictures that Letty took to see if she took any pictures of the pages since it seems as if Montrose has destroyed them. Letty followed behind him with a bat because she was scared of him. And he saw the bat, but he just kind of walked past her and acted as if he, you know, didn't have anything to say. But she was scared of him. Later, she brings him the pictures of the pages that she took, and he thanks her for stopping him from killing Montrose's ass. She tells him that seeing that side of him scared her. He says, please don't be scared of me. You know, with this, you know, uh, brooding, uh, self-deprecating, save me black man thing going on. With, ooh, look at his shoulders. You know, he all fine and sexy and everything. So, yeah, him pleading with her was definitely a turn on. So they hunch. <laughs> They hunch for the second time with no protection as if they had it back then, but still, I'm saying. So after they finish hunching, Tick goes back to translating the text. And he also tells Letty the truth about Yahima not being alive. She thinks that the magic is corrupting all of them and that it's evil. And I'm like, girl, no, it's not. The people who was using it was evil. What you talking about? Ugh. I hate when people go straight to that because that reminds me of how they demonize African spirituality. Anything that is outside the, the spectrum of Christianity is supposed to be devil worship as far as, you know, everybody's concerned. And I'm just so against that. So against that. Later on, Tick is reading those pages by himself and he reads something that upsets him and we see him call Gia. Y'all know Gia is the girl he fell in love with in Korea. And he asked her, how did she know? And we realized that what he had translated was die. So this is when he finds out from the pages that he's supposed to die. And he calls her to ask her, how did she know? And she says, you should have believed me. You should have never left. And now we like, what the hell is going on here? So let's skip over to Montrose right quick. Montrose goes to see Sammy. All right, he's upset. His son didn't beat the shit out of him. His brother is dead. He has to let off some stress. So he goes to Sammy's and without a word, they just start unbuckling pans. And then, you know, he spits this heavy wad of spit into his hand and proceeds to, you know, give Sammy the D. And I just kind of, you know, a part of me, like, was so grossed out from the spit moment and then because I also feel like you know anal kind of seems really painful to me and the way Montrose was just kind of letting off inside of him like it just it seemed painful to me but also a moment where you see Montrose holding on to Sammy for dear life and he won't kiss him in the mouth but he'll then go down on him like men are so confusing I don't know why you think you know Kissing somebody means something, but putting a peen in your mouth means nothing. Like, I don't understand that mindset, but you know what? Whatever. 
Sammy and his girls get ready to uh, go down to the gay club, all right, to go down to the ball. And Montrose is there with them, and they're all lively and excited and talking about how Sammy's going to win the ball. And Montrose is going to go with them, but Montrose just kind of sits there not saying anything the entire time. Like, he's so scared to be himself, but he's in a room full of people who know exactly who he is. So they go down to the ball and they dance and they have a good time. And we finally get to see Montrose open up. Him and Sammy dance while there's all this confetti and beauty and good time and all of these, you know, spectrum, you know, on the spectrum gay folks, you know what I'm saying? Just all over the place enjoying their lives. And finally, Montrose is able to be free in this moment and just be who he is for five seconds without having to worry about manning up. Because you know that's what goes on in his head. Whenever he wants to be his true gay self, you know what I'm saying? His true enjoy my life, in love with Sammy, kiss him down to the gay ball. Like, he can't be that. But in this moment, he's able to finally be that. And when he kisses Sammy on the dance floor, y'all, I was just like, yes yes okay dance be free live let loose okay relax your booty cheeks you know because I just felt like he was just stiff you know just real stiff and tight this whole time and it was just finally a release so good for Montrose because he needed that so y'all let's move on to episode six so episode six is Gia's episode. Um, I think it's pronounced Jaya, but I'm going to call her Gia, <laughs> just so y'all know. Um, and that's just what it is, all right? So episode six starts out with Gia singing along to Judy Garland at a picture show. But then we see it's all in her head and that she's just sitting there staring at the screen, kind of glassy-eyed maybe emotional maybe not i'm not sure but obviously something going on inside that can't be shown on the outside we're in korea 1949 and gia is in nursing school and hoping that her education will bring pride to her family to her mother who is her only family that we can see but her mother only wants her to bring home men which made us think that gia was some type of prostitute I wasn't too sure, but that's what it felt like. I'm like, is she a geisha? You know what I'm saying? I don't know if geishas are Korean. I don't want to, you know, say the wrong ethnicity or say the wrong thing for the wrong ethnicity, <laughs> you know. Um, but either way, we thought she was a hoe. But she's in nursing school. And at nursing school, they also speed date, which I thought was kind of weird. But I guess back in the day, all life was centered around a woman finding a man. So even if she is in school to save lives, we still need to find her a man. So let's do speed dating after class. I was just like, oh, okay. And she really wasn't connecting with anybody until she sat down with this one sweet man who was actually into Judy Garland movies like she is. But then he put an X over her number and we realized that he wasn't interested in her. He was more so interested in her very best friend. So she goes to the bar and finds a man to take home with her. And this is when we see what Gia really is, okay? Gia is a kumio, okay? I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but whatever, okay? A kumio is some type of spirit, okay? A spirit that is called upon by a shaman, okay? And this specific kumio that Gia is has tentacles. So whenever she becomes sexually aroused, all of her tails come out of all of her orifices, okay? Her ears, out of, you know, her nether regions, they come out of everywhere and they attach on to the man that she's having sex with. And while she's killing him, she's basically sucking his life force from him. So she gets all of his memories, everything that has happened to him in his life, everything that will happen to him if he lives past that moment, which they never really do. But she can see everything in that moment. And then her tentacles cause the man to explode and there's blood all over the place. Her Uma, her mother, comes in and says, 10 more men. So we see that Gia is kind of stuck in a rock and a hard place where she wants to be a woman of substance. She wants to work, but her mom wants her to keep bringing home men to kill. And we're not sure exactly why as of yet. Then we get to the summer of 1950 and the Americans invade Korea. The war begins and now she's a nurse and she's looking after American soldiers who are considered the enemy. They're also racist, men who are screaming obscenities at these nurses 
who are Korean and have to see after them. I mean, one man almost broke Gia's arm. And then they started hanging people in the streets who they assume were communist. And of course, the communism are, you know, are the young people, the ones who don't want to be controlled by the Americans or don't want their way of life changed. But either way, they are hanging folks in the street. And it's obvious that Gia's best friend is involved in the Communist Party. Then we find out that Gia has been replaced with the Kumio spirit that her mother called on when she found out her husband was having sex with her daughter. Now Gia has to kill a hundred men to become human again, but she doesn't want to keep killing. She's tired of seeing the, the full life story of all these terrible ass men that she has to lay up with. And when Gia tells her mom that her daughter is gone and that she doesn't have her daughter's memories, she seems to believe that her killing these men will bring her daughter back that those memories are in there somewhere. And Gia tells her that she may become human, but she will never have her daughter's memories. So she sings this song that Uma taught to Gia when she was younger. And Uma is like, see, I taught my daughter that song when she was younger. And Gia is like, yeah, and she used to sing it whenever your husband would come into the room to rape her at night. That's why I know it, because it was his memory, not hers. He handpicked Uma, a woman who had been shunned from her family for having a baby out of wedlock. And he knew what she would allow him to do to rescue her from the shame and disgrace that she had brought on her family by having a baby out of wedlock. So basically, bitch, stop coming at me like I'm the monster when you allowed that man to lay up with your daughter. And then when you finally decided to do something about it, you call on a monster to kill your husband and now you want the monster to keep killing so that he can turn back into your daughter and what you don't realize is your daughter is gone. Your daughter is gone. When Gia returns to work, the nurses have been taken hostage by American soldiers and some of the Korean soldiers fighting against the communists and they say that information has been leaked through their hospital and they are looking for the culprit. So they start shooting the nurses in the head. Tick is out there as one of the American soldiers. And right before he shoots Gia in the head, her friend jumps up and says that she's the culprit. So they punch her in the face and then they take her off somewhere. I'm sure they're gonna torture her for information. But that leaves Gia lying on the floor with two dead bodies next to her. Her friend being taken by Tick and these terrible American soldiers. She's distraught. By winter of 1950, Tick shows up wounded to her hospital and she's so filled with anger she wants to kill him. Instead, she watches him. And then one day he asks her to read a part of this book that he's reading, which has also been turned into a movie that she's seen. So she tells him the ending of the movie and he tells her that the book and the movie are not the same and that she should read the book. She tells him that she's going on her break. She's still pissed at this point. But then one day, he's outside talking to one of his soldier friends who is a Korean American. And she asked them if they've ever met Judy Garland and they laugh. And you know, they're like, we don't mean to make fun, but the only way either of us would know Judy Garland is if we worked for her. In America, people who aren't white get treated badly. She suggests that his friend stay there in Korea once the war is over. But he lets her know that he's treated just as badly by the Koreans for not being 100% Korean. He mentions that he got drafted. He didn't even want to be a part of this foolishness. But Tick, on the other hand, Tick didn't get drafted. He wanted to go to war because he wanted to get away. He wanted to get away from his father's abuse. He wanted to get out there and see the world. And somehow he thought that the war would give him adventure. And it did, but he's right back in his books trying to deal with the pain from the war. So Tick and Gia form a relationship and they start reading together and talking about their problems with their parents. And she says that they have to stop letting their parents' fear shake them. He says that that's great advice. And she says it's from her best friend. And he says that he would like to meet her. He doesn't recognize her because whenever Tick was in soldier boy mode, it seemed as if the real Tick wasn't there. 
Like he was dead in the eyes when I saw him, you know, shoot that lady like that. Later on, his partner, you know, the Korean American soldier, escorts her onto the base and he sets up this private screening for the two of them to watch a Judy Garland movie. And it was really romantical and she felt that in her spirit, okay? So she takes him home and he tells her that he's a virgin and he's never had sex before. She tells him that she's not a virgin and he says that's okay. He just wanted to tell her because she makes him feel like he's a good person, like she sees the good inside of him and it makes him forget about all of the bad things that he's done. So they get into it, right? They starting to hunch. And right before all of her tales come out, she tells him to go. And her Uma comes in upset that she didn't kill Tick. Of course, Tick ran out. She pleads to her Uma that she always has to pretend to feel something. And for the first time, she finally feels something and it's for Tick. Her mother can't believe that she feels something for the person that killed her best friend. She says if she did feel that way, then that would really make Gia a monster. And so she spits in Gia's face. So the next day, Gia shows up at the base to see Tick. And he comes out to see her, but tells her that she needs to leave. When he's walking away, she screams, you killed my best friend. When she explains what happened, he says that she was a commie sympathizer and he was just following orders. He asks, why did she even agree to go out with him? She says that she planned to kill his ass, but then she caught feelings and realized that the war had torn him apart. And she realized that they both had done monstrous things, but that didn't mean that they were monsters. And maybe they could be with each other and be the good that they see in one another. If they really want to, they both cry and it's dramatic and it's giving you the feel of a damn Judy Garland movie, okay? It is definitely giving you the romanticized World War II war movie vibes. So they finally have sex. Somehow her tentacles are kept at bay. I guess as long as she's not about to come, then the tentacles don't come out. But if she's about to come, then the tentacles gonna come out. So she was able to get on top and take control of the situation and save Tick from being eaten by her tails. While at the same time taking his virginity. It was lovely. She goes home and tells her mom that she loves Tick and that she figured out a way to keep her tails from coming out. Her mom calls her a whore, a monster, and says that he only loves her because he doesn't know what she truly is. So Atticus and Gia enjoy the winter together and they have sex again. And this time he was on top and her tails was coming out. And she tried to pull him back, y'all, but they gripped the whole of him. And she was able to see his whole life. She was even able to see his death. When she lets go of him and he's all scared, wondering what the hell just happened and what the hell she is, she's like, you can't go back home. You're going to die. You can't go back home. You're going to die. He's freaked out, so he runs off. Gia is distraught. And when her Uma comes home and sees that she is distraught, she just grabs a hold of her and rocks her as Gia cries into her arms. So they go to see the shaman and Gia sees a fox, a red fox in the snow. I wasn't exactly sure what that meant, but she stared at that fox for a while. They went to the shaman because they wanted to know if Tick was really going to die. The shaman felt like, you know, this is all human shit and, you know, you're a, a spirit. What you worrying about this human shit for? But the shaman burns a leaf and says, you will see a thousand deaths before your journey is done. Okay, so I didn't know what that meant. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I think we can pretty much surmise that Tick is going to die. So yeah, y'all, that was episodes five and six of Lovecraft Country. I hope y'all enjoyed, you guys. The show is so good. It just always makes me feel a way. So I have to be in like the mental space to deal with all the racial stuff. You know what I'm saying? But either way, I really enjoy the show. I enjoy reviewing it. I hope y'all enjoyed the review. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. I love y'all, and I'll see y'all in the next one.